Welcome to the Sisterhood of Sweat. I am here today with Michael Collins. Michael Collins is the founder of SugarAddiction.com and Quit Sugar Summit, as well as the past chairman of the board and current board member of Addiction Institute. Michael has been completely sugar-free for over 30 years and has worked closely with others to help them regain lives ravaged by this addictive product. Mike has been in recovery from substance use disorder for over 35 years, and he can speak on recovery topics separate from sugar. He raised two children sugar-free from the womb to over six years old, and, and when they only had sugar, they only had it once a month for their entire childhood. His book, which was rated number one in Healthy Living on Amazon, is going to be available to you guys. So I will put that in the show notes. And this was a great conversation for anybody out there. If you guys can relate, I know I'm probably preaching to the choir on this, being addicted to sweets or sugar or having cravings for things that you don't realize have sugar in them, like milk products that have natural sugars and bread and all sorts of things, pasta that you may not recognize. Today we talk about, uh, is sugar the original gateway drug to other drugs? Is sugar addiction a real thing? Is it serious? Uh, we learn about sugar's revenge and why you might get the keto flu, which really he talks about, is that just a sugar withdrawal? Are sugar withdrawals real? And we talk about detoxing from sugar, everything about why you want to break the sugar habit and how to do it. Michael is your go-to guy. He had, he had such great information on this topic and so easy to listen to. I hope you guys really enjoy this as we kick the sugar habit and ditch the sugar itch. Let's dive into this episode without further ado for the one and only Michael Collins. I am so excited to welcome Michael Collins today. Hey, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. It's, it's uh, an honor. Appreciate it. Well, we are talking about a really important topic today, you guys, and I know you're going to love this episode with Michael. He is all about helping us get over our cravings, our sugar addictions, which have to be at an all-time high right now because we're going through a lot with this pandemic. How have you found that to play out, Michael? Oh, wow. You're opening the Pandora's box. First question, huh? That's good. So when the pandemic started, people don't realize that uh, they weren't only just sold out of toilet paper. They were sold out of sugar and flour. Baking went through the roof. Now the, the numbers are in. All of the candy producers, chocolate producers, all way up during the pandemic, okay? So people basically uh went locked down with all their favorite treats and kind of abused sugar and our challenge we do these challenges that in january just exploded because people now have been locked down for six or eight months and they finally said enough is enough they're up they call it the pandemic 15 i think they're instead of the freshman 15 in college people had gained all this weight now here's the sad part is that the comorbidities which is the people that are passing away from COVID, like the percentages are, I think it's like 60% have symptoms of metabolic syndrome, which is caused by sugar, too much carbs, too high blood sugar, right? They, the people with diabetes, the people with asthma, the people with things that inflammations of all kinds, these are the folks that are getting hit the hardest with COVID. And this is coming from the bigger scientists. This is just not me and it's not the news it's coming from the bigger scientists now as the, as the uh, you know, the records come in of the, of the fatalities. So it's a, it's a big, you know, I think it's a reckoning for folks. They're starting to realize that this stuff can be, you know, dangerous and definitely to your immune system. 
Now, how does sugar play a role in addiction in general? Well, <laughs> you, you're, you don't pull any punches. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you, you're going you're going right to the heart of it all so basically you know in my belief and in you know 35 years of sobriety and helping people get off all kind of substances that, that any the substance that you can think of and raising two sugar-free kids 30 years ago i and studying this and you know being the owner of sugaraddiction.com for a, over a decade and helping coach people I believe with all my heart, and the science is bearing me out. In the last five years, the science is now catching up with the anecdotal knowing that I knew many years ago is that sugar is the original gateway drug. Sugar leads people to other drugs. Abuse of sugar, heavy use of sugar leads people into other drugs. There's a great YouTube video with Eric Clapton out there on YouTube. It's short. He's being interviewed at 60 Minutes, Ed Bradley. They're sitting in his $7 million Antigua Treatment Center. And he says, so Eric, this addiction thing, it started with heroin, right? And, uh, and Eric Clapton says, no, and it started with sugar. I said, when he was five and six years old, he would eat bread and butter and sugar sandwiches. To, he said, to change his state, anything that would make me feel better. And to have had that awareness, obviously he owns a treatment center, he understands it, he's been sober for 20 years or 15 years. And so he understands it and he understands what happened to him. And, and the, tr the treatment centers that do better, have better success rates are the ones who do understand this concept and change the, the food within their system. So it's the original gateway drug, Linda. It's the original gateway drug. There's no doubt in my mind. Wow. That, that's that's like you know some serious stuff right there you're laying down some good facts yeah. and i will say that i would you know for everybody that loves coffee out there yeah it's like another addiction a caffeine addiction and i kicked it i i'm trying to think if it's been maybe four to six months ago um and and literally i like what i like about it is i don't feel like you know how you just feel like you need that coffee in the morning. You got to have that coffee to feel right. You got to go get that coffee you, right. and you want more coffee because you had some coffee and it's just, it's an addiction. And I really like not having anything that has a hold on me nice. now that I haven't been using it and drinking it at all. Right. Um, and I do find I'm much calmer. I will say, uh, I was very heavily caffeinated before. Wow. And I congratulate you. That's great. <laughs> thanks. So I, I'm really enjoying um, being free from, from that addiction as well as a sugar addiction. And I know a lot of people out there really suffer from, from the sugar addiction. What are some ways that they can, you know, ditch the sugar itch? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I commend you for the caffeine. And I, I want to add that uh, in our protocol, we suggest people quit the caffeine because it does jack your blood sugar and does lead you back to craving sugar. And for the most part, it's kind of married neuro in your neural pathways. Usually sh caffeine is ingested with sugar, either in chocolate or, or tea or coffee. And so the two are, so they got this phrase wired together, fired together meaning the, you know, the, the, the neural pathways when they're, you know, you're getting sugar, you're getting caffeine, you want the other, you want both, whatever. So they're very, very tied. And we have to, I used to once work with this Olympic athlete and uh, her coaches started her drinking caffeine when she was 10 years old, not Coca-Cola, coffee. And at 10 for her performance, and she just couldn't get off the sugar. I mean, she, this woman could do anything with her body, but she could not get off the sugar for months we worked. And uh, come to find, I didn't know about this kid. This was years ago, but I didn't know about the, uh, how much caffeine she was drinking, right? She's drinking black coffee still. And when we got her off the coffee, she was able to get off the sugar. So, you know, the way that you're able to get off the, the, uh, um, the sugars, you have to, when you get to be an adult, you're essentially just fighting off withdrawals. You're not really getting a buzz. You're not getting a lift. You're not like, it's not energy. It's not anything like that. You're just, and you have to realize what you have to do is you have to cleave apart the idea that you're looking for a sweet taste or whatever. 
what you're looking for is a dopamine hit. You're looking, this has been proven out in the last five years. You're looking to get a little squirt of dopamine to feel a little bit better for a few more minutes so that you don't go, start going into withdrawals. And withdrawals themselves are, you know, although it's, I want people to think nicotine, not heroin, not alcohol. This is a niggling, nasty little habit that's hard to quit. And when you start to quit, you start to feel cravings for the product, right? And sometimes nasty cravings for the product. And so you have to pass through that. But the reason I always say that all the sugar detoxes on the market are wrong is because what happens with the regular sugar detoxes, they actually try and give you pretty pictures of stuff you used to make with sugar and then try and make it in like keto stuff or you know, fake sugars and all this kind of stuff. And it doesn't address the root issue. And the root issue is what I mentioned is the dopamine and serotonin and everything. And so until people understand that's what's happening to them and understand that we share our delivery system of this drug, which is sugar, which is a heavy toxin, a neurotoxin, a psychoactive drug with food. And look, we're not, you know, you do a little alcohol, you do a little heroin, you do a little cocaine. We are pounding 20 to, that's average, 20 to 30 to 40 uh, teaspoons of sugar a day the Coke's got 12 in it, right? A small Coke. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about like a, a situation where we have never, and since we were children, ever been off of this, you know, the dose makes the poison, right? I mean, we've never been off of this. Our, our dopamine's always been in fight or flight. The reason you're calm now is because, you know, you're healing up. Your nucleus accumbens has stopped being manipulated by the caffeine. And so it's, I like podcasts simply because we don't have a sound bite. Like we don't have a meat is murder. Or we don't have a friends don't let friends drive drunk thing. We need, I need 15, 20, 30 minutes to set up what's going on with people and their sugar. And it is nothing to do with food. It's only about 10% of the solution to this problem is food or what they eat. I mean, yes, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> you've got you to get off the sugar and you have to eat whole food. But beyond that, there's more to it for people to understand. You've probably heard this. This is scientific lore. This is scientific, like everybody knows about this. There's hundreds of studies about it. Most people who lose any amount of weight gain it all back in the first year. And the reason that happens is because they... Um, and all the diet books, anything that says lose weight says stop the white stuff, cut back on the sugars, cut back on the powder, the, you know, whatever the carbs. But what happens is they don't substitute that emotional management system that they've been using since they were a child. Probably their mother used it on them. That's called sugar. And they don't change that. They don't go for a run. They don't go to the gym. They don't do something different instead of getting the dopamine hit from sugar, they don't, they don't substitute something. They try and like eat a little different or they try and exercise for, to lose weight, but they don't address the root problem. So it's, it's taken time. We've done thousands of these detoxes. We've seen every possible combination <laughs> that people could go through. And just that information, I really appreciate you having me on because it takes a little time for folks to get the whole story. Well, let's dive into your backstory a little bit. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about how you suffered from addiction and your recovery process? Absolutely. And, and it's, a, it's a very instructive for a lot of folks in that um, I thought I was a regular kid. You know, I thought I grew up as a regular kid. My mom was a sugar junkie, right? And uh, she was my favorite sugar junkie, but she, she, it's kind of a sad story. I mean, my grandmother died when she was only eight years old, right? And, and so they had to move in with my great aunt or her, her aunt. And my grandfather had to work all the time and, and they owned the country store across the way. And so anytime my mom went into that store, she did not have to pay. She, they, it was a great gesture. They just put it on the account because they were trying to uh, you know, help a, a young child get over the loss of her mom. And it was a wonderful gesture then when the science was not there, but really as it evolved, my mom began to believe, and I think she died, but almost died. Well, she didn't die because she really got it at the end, but um, it was like, she thought sugar was love for everyone. And 
we lived that cookies and candy and she had a stash and we knew where it was and you know just we we grew up this way we would <laughs> we would literally be able to scrape a half of inch of sugar off the bottom of the sugar of the cereal bowl after we put it on our cornflakes or, or our cheerios you know and we would use uh, kool-aid we would have like uh three times the sugar that the recipe called for and you know candy through my whole childhood whatever i i, I was in there wasn't a candy i didn't like except butterscotch i liked everything and i ate everything and and at great volume and that was around our house all the time we had ice cream all the time so fast forward about 14 years old i run into beer so beer i knew changed my state it made me feel they used to call it liquid courage i was kind of shy i could talk to girls and so, uh, you know, I, that party lasted until I was 28 years old. And I can talk anything about that part of it. But the relevant part about the sugar is that I went right back to sugar, as did many and as do many people who are recovering from alcohol and drugs, right? They go right back to sugar. And so, I, I mean, I gained 20 pounds just like that. I'm a thin athletic guy and I just gained, my face was all acne and you know, all, all red and everything. It was even worse than when I was using drugs and drinking. And that I saw this in all the people that would try and get sober from alcohol and drugs. They gained 30 or 40 pounds. All the meetings were covered up with sugar, coffee, nicotine. It was like, I said, this can't be right. And so I read this book called Sugar Blues and it talked about the slave trade and England and how sugar got into our diet and then how to get out of it. And so I raised a couple, I, I it took me a couple years back and forth, back and forth, back and forth to get off the sugar. But then I had a, uh, I don't know how I talked my wife at the time into doing this, but we had a couple of, we had twins and she was no sugar, no flour, no caffeine during the pregnancy from the beginning of the you know we found out all the way to they were six years old and really it was a it's an incredible story i can tell you more about that but um they really grew up with no sugar and and you know very little after the six-year-old time that they had it and so they always my kids always said dad you should write a book about sugar so i did and and you know it was out on amazon a couple of years ago and I bought the name, the domain name, sugaraddiction.com about 10 years ago, but nothing happened. I would get the greatest information. I'd research it and I put it out there. I'd do blogs, nothing happened. Nobody, I mean, some people would run with it, but for the most part, um, it wasn't until about three years ago when I started coaching people how to get off sugar, uh, having groups, having Zoom meetings like this with, you know, 40 people in them where that, that people started to get real results right they started to and the reason we found out is because they need support because society's not ready for this message and you feel like the odd man out and you feel weird and you feel like you know sometimes they're the only person in their family and they've still got to cook for the kids or they've got a the spouse is not supporting and so yeah that's the short version but uh <clears throat> you know I, i'm a firm believer, as we mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, that sugar was the original drug that I abused, not, you know, beer or marijuana or cocaine, you know. What do you think, uh, you know, as far as your children not having sugar, yeah. what differences did you see in them, do you think, because of that? You know, that's a great question. And I get that a lot because people think we fought the Montessori school. We fought the grandparents, literally their own grandparents, the, the friends, the parents of friends, because they thought that we were depriving them of a childhood. We thought the, that they were missing out on the pleasures of childhood. Right. But that's just not the case. You know, my kids do not have and this is the best and this science has bared out in the last five years i didn't know this was what was happening five, 20 30 years ago but they do not have this grooved pathway in their brain that makes them when they're anxious or worried or scared or upset to reach for sugar i mean when was the last time you saw a movie where a woman broke got broken up with her by her boyfriend and didn't have an ice cream party right <laughs> I mean, it's just the way it is, right? And it's like a cultural norm. Well, my kids didn't do that. And as a result, they didn't have a draw to other substances. They, they, they matured emotionally, uh, I believe. And 
there's a common construct in the world of alcohol and drug addiction, uh, drug addiction that if you started using drugs and alcohol when you were 14 or 15, that's when you stop growing emotionally. And that manifests itself in your relationships, in your you know, ability to make a living, in your, your, stu, your, your, responsi your level of responsibility. And then that manifests itself in, this life, in, a, in your life. And that's how most addicts' life looks. You know. They just stop solving problems in an emotional fashion you know, because they're stunted by this drug. Well, imagine going back to childhood when your mom would give you a cookie when you were upset you train yourself, you've been trained to when you're upset, when you're crying, when you're hurt, when you're angry, that you would go and use sugar, right? And that is the pattern we need to interrupt. That's the pattern that people need to learn about on podcasts like this. They need to understand what's going on. The folk, they're not looking for a sweet taste. They're looking for a dopamine hit. They're looking for a, a, just a little squirt of a relief of a drug chemical, a neurochemical that has been evolved over 10 million years to help us survive as a species. And for the last 300 years, we've evolved into our system, into our food system, into our cultural system, the, this drug that is very easy to access, very inexpensive, and folks have used it for that. And if you talk to anyone who's lost 100 or 200 pounds, you'll know that this is the recovery. This is the change that they went through. Had very little to do with how much they exercised, had very little to do with how much they um, ate or what they ate. Yes, they had to eat whole foods. It had to do with this reordering of their emotional maturity uh, system, how they deal with trauma, how they deal with upset and hurt and worry and pain. And until people get that, I think, I don't know if I said it yet, but we don't, um, we don't have a tagline, meat is murder. We don't have a, you know, friends don't let friends drive drunk. You can't explain this in, in just a, a tagline. It needs a little bit of setup and you're very gracious to let me ramble on on my soapbox, but thank you. Well, that's what you're here for. <laughs> Everybody is going to be really interested. My, uh, I had somebody else talking about uh, sugar, but not quite in this way. And it was <laughs> quite a hit. A lot of people, you know, downloaded cool. that episode. Uh, cool. So several questions run across my mind. I'll, I'll go with the first one. Yeah. Uh, as far as dopamine, if we're trying to get dopamine... Is it because we had dopamine before or do we need dopamine? Good question. So, you know, in the last five years, the, the, uh, uh, the science has exploded. I mean, they literally slide people into MRIs. They let them sip on a syrupy, sugary drink, and then they watch their brains. They watch what goes on, right? And so they see this happening. And they do that with alcohol. They drink alcohol, same thing. Well, it's the same place. It lights up the exact same place. Cocaine lights up the same place. The difference is, is the dose. We're doing a lot more sugar. We're doing a little alcohol, a little heroin, a little cocaine. We're doing a lot of sugar. And uh, like 40 teaspoons, some people, 30, whatever. And so people, um, it's interesting you asked this question. I just heard this the other day because the body the, the way the brain's way to love itself is to get a dopamine hit. It just makes you feel better. It makes you, you feel better, more calm. I actually think it's literally the perfect drug. If you were not an abuser and you didn't come develop a problem, it's for sex. It's for getting new food. It's the reason we evolved, right? And the brain doesn't care how it gets it. Could be illicit sex, illegal drugs, gambling. It doesn't care how it gets the dopamine. The easy way to get dopamine is just to ingest sugar and then you get a little bit of it. And this is something, like I said, that evolved over uh, hundreds, millions of years, hundreds of thousands or millions of years to help us stay alive. And, and the other brain chemicals as well in the nucleus accumbens, the serotonin, the, the norepinephrine, the GABA, um, all of these things are affected we don't know as much about those yet. We do know a little bit about serotonin because serotonin gives us peace and calm, right? This is what we're trying to dial in when we do SSRIs. Uh, these are, you know, things people take for depression and anxiety, right? These are pills that you're given. 
But what they're trying to do is they're trying to dial in the feeling, meaning, well, this one didn't work, only take a half of this one, get, let's try this one, let's change your prescription. They're trying to dial in each individual person. Well, we're doing that personally, we're self-medicating with sugar, flour, caffeine, alcohol, drugs. We're self-medicating, trying to get this even feeling, you know, this even, you know, uh, how, how we really should feel naturally, like you feel now without the caffeine. It's like you're trying to get back to whether it's God or nature, however you believe, meant us to feel, which is pretty steady most of the time, unless we're being chased by a cyber saber tooth tiger. Yeah. You know, we're not in fight or flight. We're pretty steady, you know. And then we get a dopamine hit when we're chasing down some, some food or whatever, or we're making love. These things that this, the, the, the body evolved to do, what it was not evolved to do was to manipulate it with uh, 30, 20, 30 teaspoons of sugar a day, 150 pounds a year to never be off it, to never be out of fight or flight, to never be out of dopamine uh, di and blood sugar dysregulation, up and down, up and down, up and down that, you know, and, you know, the reason we can do it is because it's damn near free and everywhere and it's in all our food. And so it's just, you know, it's a, like I said, it takes about a podcast to explain it. Now it's in 85% of the food. So no one is immune to this, right? Even if you're not a 100 pounds overweight, 200 pounds overweight, a, you know, verified a food, you know, confirmed food addict, uh, you're still affected by it, you know? Uh, a long answer to a nice question, but. <laughs> what, can, what can we do to get dopamine, dopamine a lot more naturally so that I think everything in the natural is generally better yeah. uh, because it comes without a million serious side effects. And sure. so what are the best ways for us to get dopamine? Like, Because I think if you're getting it the right way, you wouldn't be craving it so much. Absolutely. You don't have those highs and lows. It is steadier. Um, well, I mean, things that I've mentioned, uh, and these are things that during the detox, you have to substitute. You know, Tony Robbins calls it the pattern interrupt. You have to, you have to interrupt the pattern of I want sugar. So you have to do the things like you say are natural, which is go for a walk, go for a run, go to yoga, lift weights, um, get a hug, make love, anything that will you know, give you a little bit of dopamine and substitute for your craving. Because remember, we were conditioned coming up from childhood that if we had a worry or a pain or, you know, anxious or whatever, we would ingest sugar. And so instead of use, instead of recreating that habit over and over till we're way overweight or sick, we need to interrupt that pattern and then go and, 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 do these things that I mentioned, these natural things, even searching out a different food that's healthy will give you dopamine. So if you, if you've never tried a vegetable, or if you've never tried uh, beef liver or something that you've never tried, you will get a little dopamine hit for trying a new food, you know? So there's a lot of different ways and it's essentially self-care, right? When you're taking care of yourself and not allowing the simple, easier, softer way of just ingesting sugar to make you feel better. And that's basically how you do it. You have to do it at the same time. The reason I always say that most of the sugar detoxes on the market are wrong is because they focus on the food. They focus on changing the recipe into something uh, that you can make with sweeteners or you know artificial sweeteners or stevia or monk fruit. That doesn't help because when you get that sweet taste, you want more. So you have to really literally think about, you have to uncouple the food and the sweetness from the behavior and the, and the seeking for the dopamine seeking. So I know that's a, sometimes it sounds confusing, but it's really pretty simple to divorce. Because remember, we share our delivery system of this, this psychoactive, very powerful toxin with food, our whole food. So the body, when it craves it, it craves it in our mouth. It, it wants to feel the taste or the crunch or whatever. And it fe we feel, you know, and the body's smart. Remember the brain? It wants the dopamine hit. It will manifest these craving feelings. And the thing that people are really in love with, and they just love this stuff, is that 
if you can get 30, 60, 90 days out, those create those physical cravings literally disappear, gone, no more. Yeah. And they that's you that's the freedom you talk about. Right. Cut sugar out if you want to if you want to be free from sugar, yeah. cut it out completely. <laughs> it's kind of a, really it's like a catch 22, right? Mm-hmm. You got to go 100% abstinence just to test it out. I call it a scratch test. Like if you were to go to allergist, they'd scratch you for pollen and ragweed and dust and whatever, you know. But I, this scratch test is like just give yourself that break of 30 or 60 or 90 days everything tastes better after you not initially but after a few weeks of cutting out all the overpowering tastes of crap (laughs) of food of junk uh you will get in touch with your natural taste buds you know you'll be able to taste the naturalness of your food and a sweet potato will be like ambrosia Mm -hmm. and when you're eating even just a bison burger, it's going to taste like you're having steak because you're, you're hungry and you're eating natural food instead of overpowering your taste buds with all this junk. I mean, you no know, truer words were ever spoken. I have so many testimonials of people saying, man, I taste the sweetness in carrots and peppers and uh, really tasting sweet macadamia nuts taste like candy. Um, yeah. I mean, they literally have scientists. I don't know if the book's around here somewhere, but they have scientists that, yeah, this book here. I mean, folks literally, like I got it all marked up and everything. Salt, Sugar, and Fat by Michael Moss, right? And basically what's going on is they have scientists on the other side trying to find this bliss point where people take just, it's just sweet mm-hmm. enough, right? Yeah. And, 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 and when, you know, when you, uh, when you, for, when you stop it, and your taste buds readjust, real food just tastes so much better. It, it's so right. weird how that happens for sure. And and also I would equally say I did an experiment with fake foods after mm. I did a competition. I never would go and do what most people did, which was they would binge eat all the things they never ate during show mm. prep. And I thought, you know, I have never, ever done that, but you know, I'm going to take today because sometimes it seems like if you just take that one day, you've got it out of your system and then we'll move on. So I said, all right, I think I'm going to do this. And so (laughs) I was eating the junk and it was getting to be nighttime and I think I was eating what it was some kind of cheese puff I had brownies I I ate stuff I never eat and I remember thinking oh you could just eat your way through this bag and never be satisfied because this food is fake it's not real food and that was like such a epiphany to me that that's why people just they it's just not real once you eat that real food you're satisfied. You get satisfied with real food. No, hundred percent. You're exactly right. So I got a question for you. Did you ever pass through in, in, in training for shows, the carb loading phase where you would gain weight and then cut weight? Um, oh, I know what you're talking about. Uh, when I carb load, I don't gain weight. I lose weight. Really? I gotcha. It's weird, but I think it's because usually before that I've done a lot of carb rotations or really cutting back on carbs so you may be not eating carbs and you're only carb loading two days a week and when i carb load it's not like fake food it's sweet potatoes (laughs) it's banana i got you so no I i don't gain weight from carb loading but i know what you're talking about it's a phase where people Um, it's kind of like a refeed or a reverse dieting where they are trying to put on this weight to strip down to lean. And then they cut it. Then they, then they go without it for a couple weeks before the show. And then they real ripped. Yeah. Yeah. The carb loading, what the carb loading does is it keeps you from looking flat and stringy. It fills your Um, muscle out. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. And if you're lean, 
uh, you need that because uh, it's can cannot oh it doesn't always look good if you right. have a little fullness to your muscles. Wow, well, I'm I'm learning something here about it. I have a we have we do this quit sugar summit every year, and there's this guy. He's a professor down in South Africa. He's very famous in South Africa. He, he wrote a book called The Lore of Running. And uh, for years, he preached carb loading for, to fuel runners, right? Yeah. Well, at 60, he developed diabetes too. Mm -hmm. And he literally had to apologize to his constituency. This book's actually famous in the United States too, The Lore of Running, for in the running community. And, uh, and he wrote a book called The Lore of Nutrition and kind of reversed his thought. And now he's, his diabetes is in remission at 70. So yeah, it's a, it's an interesting way that things evolved into both athletics and, uh, and diets in general. You know, people are always talking about the carbs and the whatever, you know, low carb, high carb, whatever. So, so I would say that, you know, I, I did Spartan racing at the time and I was doing like a trifecta in the Spartan and a trifecta at Fitness America. So I was doing three shows at Fitness America in a day. And then three, like I did the Beast, if you're familiar with Spartan, but so yeah, a lot I of know. my listeners are. I did the Beast, the Super, the Sprint in that order. And mm -hmm. I was, I was, my coach fought me. She did not want me to uh, yeah, do this contest dieting and do these he heavy races. And I, cause I was on virtually no carbs and I actually won my category in, uh. in the East. it was my first race. And I did not, it was, I was not fueled by carbs. I ate really good fats. Nice. And so I don't think you necessarily have to have a huge amount of carbs, though I would say, don't do what I did because I went, I took it too far. And then I had hypoglycemia the day of my fitness america contest oh okay i got yeah. you i took it too far so yeah you got to have carbs i think for brain function you got to have some mm, gotcha so, so, so go ahead what else can i help what else can i uh <laughs> impart on your folks i'm you know Oh gosh, think, so, so many things. Let's, let me ask you about this one because I know what I think go-tos are for supplements, but what kind of things would you tell people if they're really, they're trying to kick the sugar and they're having a hard time? Are there any little, mm, I don't know if I want to say quick fix, but something that they could do to kind of ease them into this getting off of sugar so they don't get the keto flu? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of really good research and a lot of people have done it for a long time. The some amino acids that work very well for that. Um, they're all available over the counter. Um, uh, L-glutamine, tyrosine, uh, GABA, these kinds of things. They help. Remember, you're, you're not trying to, uh, you're, you are fighting off an addiction, but you're really trying to rebuild your brain. You're trying to rehab, literally, it's literally a brain rehab. So that, you know, what I find a lot of times is people, when they get off of it, the 30 or 60, 90 days, whatever, longer, they really think to themselves, how could my behavior have ever been, how could I have ever thought that my behavior was acceptable, even to myself, where they would be, you know, either morbidly obese or even overweight, and that they knew, they, they knew everything about dieting, they knew everything about nutrition, but they couldn't stop. And the science is really coming out now that says, you know, it doesn't matter about calories in, calories out. Yes, you have to eat whole food, but it really matters is how, how well your brain is functioning and to understand that when you want sugar, you basically want a dopamine hit and that you have, in science, it's called down-regulating. You, you have thinned out, you have less, dopamine receptors. And so, and that's just really the beginning of the science that's exploded in the last five years. And the people that have been working with these amino acids, uh, those folks are, they've done four and five and 6,000 people, individual one-on-one -on -one in treatment centers. They're very familiar with which one works when. There's a lot of, uh, what's that word? Um, Contraindications. There's a lot of like, uh, you got to be a little careful. We can't have some of these things when you're pregnant or so there's different things. Oh, correct. 
Yeah. yeah there's some different things that you can't have uh, or you can't use them for. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that would, if there's an easy button, if there's an easy pill, uh, there's a lot of uh, sci science developing around that. Another thing I really believe in with all my heart that I think the world changes on is something called the continuous glucose monitor. I don't know if you're familiar with these. So CGMs are normally used for diabetics types one and two, mm -hmm. but there's a rash of companies that are now developing uh, it for biohacking. In other words, in right. the United States, you need you need to get a prescription, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so they've worked out in every state how to get everybody one, and they've lowered the price and whatever, and they give you a dietitian, you know, whatever. But the bottom line is, right on your phone, you can see your blood sugar. Yeah. You can see that a sweet potato will do this, a chocolate right. bar will do that, a soda, you know, it'll knock you right out of, you know, average or normal or healthy blood sugar ranges. And so in real time, you can literally get a baseline and train yourself that, and everybody's different. So everybody using a different, um, right. they'll, they'll all figure it out. Like some people, sweet mm -hmm. potato won't affect it at all. Correct. And some people will knock a banana. Some they'll knock people right out. So, and, and forget about, you know, actual sugar, real, you know, chocolate bars or whatever, ice cream that always throw and almost everyone gets thrown out of the, the healthy range. And for people who are, like I say, pounding these 30, 40 teaspoons a day, which is 20 is average. So, I mean, a Coke's got 12 grams of sugar, you know, or something like that, 12 teaspoons of sugar. And so people that are always on it, meaning their digestive system always has, they're always trying to remove sugar. They stay at a high range, you know, they stay up in the, the, the place where it's causing inflammation, brain fog, acne, weight gain. They never get down to the healthy range. So a CGM would really help those folks if they're, you know, willing to, it's only a little pin prick on your arm, a little patch, like a nicotine patch. It's not like invasive in any way. And I believe Amazon and Google are both working on this. Non-invasive ones where you can wear it just like a watch or a Fitbit and they'll be able to tell your blood sugar. You just be able to look at it. Oh, well, I shouldn't eat that chocolate bar or whatever. And so when that happens and it gets down to like a hundred bucks, then the world, everybody's uh, you know, eyes are you know, wide open. No excuses then because then they can just look at their watch and say that they shouldn't be eating that. Because now well, you yeah. figure you can get away with the donut. You can get away with this and you can for probably 20 or 30 years. Then it catches you. So Yeah, and, and I find it interesting what you're saying. Uh, I'm going to be doing a challenge, and when I took this course, it's advanced hormone hormone course from IIN, which is Integrated School of Nutrition. Okay. They had us do blood sugar testing, which is basically what you're talking about, and you you use the, the yeah. blood you know the blood monitor. You you're sticking your finger. Yeah, all the time, and yeah. so seriously, I didn't get very much blood until my son really showed. <laughs> got to like pull down through the finger, massage it down, milk it. Yeah, yeah. And then the blood just flows so that you can get an accurate reading. If you're, yeah. if you're not, if you don't have access to what Michael's talking about, just doing a simple blood sugar test. And sure. so we're, we'll be doing that in our challenge. And then I'll be able to tell people after they fast exactly when they eat this, eat that, where they fall on love it yeah great idea it's huge because you'll find out oh wow my body doesn't metabolize oatmeal or yep. you know, whatever it is and, and you have to do it periodically because your body changes as you wean yourself from these substances yeah, that's the difference between the two devices and they, the finger pricks have been around a while. Yeah. You have to take, but you know, you have to say before you have to do it before you eat, then you have to do an hour after you eat, then you have to do an hour after that. So you can see what happened in the graph and the continuous one will show you like all the time, you know? Yeah, I think the other way sounds better. And I will tell you, after I was pricking my finger and did not, you know, know how to get the blood flow going, I thought, yeah, I'm not doing this on a regular basis because it's, you know, I had to do too many finger. Yeah, you do three or four and the one finger starts to hurt. Yeah, then you're like, that doesn't feel very good. <laughs> but once I figured out how to do it correctly, then I was like, okay, I could do this. I don't want to do it all the time. But No, it's perfect for a challenge. I, I agree. It's perfect for a challenge. People get her, but they got to get a baseline. They, 
I mean, some people, like I said, they will prick them and they'll be like 180, 190, 200. And they're like, and it doesn't go down. It doesn't go back to the, you know, the 70 to 130 range where it should be or 70 to, you know. Uh, so yeah, it, it, they got to get that baseline. So one more thing I want to ask you, because I know this happens whenever I have people following my plans in, in my book, The Sisterhood of Sweat, uh, people will get, you know, because they were eating fast food and they were eating junk and now they're eating all clean, they'll get like the flu. And do you think this is really just sugar withdrawals? What do you think causes the, them to get sick? Oh, absolutely. I think, you know, a lot of the, um, definitely the keto flu is that the, the, it's identical. I mean, the, if you read the if you put the two symptoms side by side, they're all the same, exactly the same symptoms. Um, and the regular flu, I think, is is the body's way of trying to rest and to detox from sugar. It's a kind of a natural push to detox, for sure. You know. So yeah, I mean, I'm not. I, I'm probably people say I'm too. I, I say it actually. I'm too holistic for my own good. You know. And and I find that people who have toxicities of all kinds um, that these quote unquote flus and things that where they get sick or, I mean, they're just detoxing from the crap. The body's saying enough already. And they're going to shut you down and they're going to give you the runs and the sniffles and the urination. And I mean, look at, look at uh, the pre-diabetes symptom of frequent urination. One of the benefits of what we do is that people can sleep through the night. Okay. For the first time in their life, they don't get up three and four times to pee. And this thing, this is like better, the better benefit than losing weight or anything else because they get a good night's sleep. Because like, like I said, the, the, one of the symptoms of diabetes and prediabetes is frequent urination. And it's the, it's the body system trying to detox the worst in, worst out first, right? And so that the sugar comes first. And then all the other toxins, they don't get to get out because the body's working its ass off to get the sugar out and peeing yeah. and sweating and doing everything else to get it out. And then when they get off the sugar, the withdrawals are simply the other toxins now have a chance to get out. They get into the blood system from the fat and everything else. And then they're, then you're going to feel lousy and you know, you're going to be in withdrawal. So yeah, it's a, definitely all these kind of things are man-made at some level, right? They're, they're, they're like the sad American diet, the standard American diet uh, is, is causing these things. And then when people like, the reason I know this is because I've had thousands of people like get off every kind of medication, put diabetes two in remission, uh, get off SSRIs and you know all kind of. Not me. Their doc says this. I just got them off sugar. I didn't change this. Their doctor told them to change. Right. And right. so they basically have been detoxed correctly, you know. And right. so yeah, yeah. Right. Like like I know there's a lot of different detoxes out there. Right. Uh, so what kind of method do you use? Well, as I mentioned, you know, after, you know, genius is only pattern recognition, right? After doing thousands of these, I can tell you what's going to happen for most people. If I know their body weight and they know the size of their habit, I can pretty much tell how long it's going to take and when they're going to have their worst times, right? And the average person who's just, you know, a couple, 20, 30, 10, 20 pounds overweight their worst time is between days three and five. They're going to be, if they quit flour, sugar, and caffeine, they will literally be incapacitated depending on their habit. They'll be sleeping yeah, all day. Yeah, I had some people get really sick. Yeah, yeah. And they'll, they'll have headaches yeah. and they'll be, start, this be alternatively mm -hmm. nauseous and starving, right? And sweats at night, they'll soak their sheets. And it's kind of, you know, it's, it's not pretty sometimes. And, uh, and, but after that, you know, they, they, it starts to calm down. You're still hungry for about 20 days all the time. And so you got to eat healthy food. Um, but you'll, the, you know, the sun starts shining days 15 to 20. And then, then the mental game kicks in. Then that, that famous, those famous big loser studies, the famous studies of you know, those hundreds of these studies where when people lose a whole bunch of weight, usually they all gain it back in the first year. And the reason that ha over 90% and the reason that happens is because they got off the sugar, the white stuff to lose the weight, white knuckled it and didn't lay into place at the same time, the things you and I have been talking about through this entire podcast, which is they didn't figure out that this is an emotional issue. Only 10% of it's about the food. This is about 
what do I do when I'm craving sugar? How do I interrupt the pattern, right. change it, right? And when they do that and they do it during the detox, not after the detox, you know, they do it during the detox, even if it's just the, you know, day three, when you're feeling nasty, the only goal is to drink a lot of water and take a little walk and then sleep the rest of the day. That's all you got to do. Do it again the next day. Do it. So now you're craving sugar. You're so, you know, you're thinking about it. You're thinking about it. And instead your mind goes to go for a walk. And then when you get to like day 44, you realize that you're not craving sugar. You're craving a walk. You're craving a different way to ingest the dopamine, to squirt the dopamine in your little gland there, you know, or to get the I receptors. Love I love that. Yeah. And it's so important because people neglect this. They don't think about it. They think, oh, just give me a, that's all they ever, oh, you probably have this. What do I eat? What, how's my, what do I exercise? Especially someone who's a bodybuilder, they want to know what's my diet, what's my macros, and what do I do? What weights do I lift when? Well, that you can all have that all perfect. And I have, I've had Olympic athletes. I've, you know, I, that can be all perfect. If you don't understand the things that I'm telling you, mm -hmm. you're bound to repeat it in the future when life gets tough again. Like when there's a, like a crisis, a divorce or upset or. No, financial, right, right. Then you go fall back to the, the system that you used before. Yeah. To, that's the sugar. You have to find a different way to relieve your stress. And I have three go-tos when, okay. when I have sugar cravings. Yeah. And you, you named one, which would be uh, glutamine. I would take a little glutamine and mix it in some water and drink that down. Yep. If you have diabetes, though, they say it could be contraindicated. So I want to put that out there. Yeah. Um, and then cinnamon tea or just some cinnamon and whatever i'm having okay it, it it lowers the blood sugar because you may be maybe you haven't been eating at the right times throughout the day which causes your blood sugar to you know crash and burn mm -hmm. so having that blood sugar stable is really a huge key besides all this the dopamine and then chromium for three i like to have take some chromium to just level out my blood sugar. We got gotcha. you. There you go. Yeah, there's just there's a lot of different substitutions. I like the ones that are more manual, simply because They're whether easier. it's yoga, workout, whatever. Uh, these are things that are more natural. They're they're a way that you're um, you know, we evolved to do basically. Well, this is like you know, we walked five miles a day back in the day or whatever, and that kind of became our system, right? And not that you can replicate very people few people aren't can, moving enough. Yeah, they're not moving enough. And if they were, then maybe they wouldn't crave as much, you know? Right, right. I think it's good to have a system though. That's for, so I hope everybody that's listening today can get a lot of takeaways from what we're talking about. And maybe some of the wheels start to turn and this begins to make sense. But mm -hmm. if you need a little additional help, <laughs> Michael, can you tell them about your challenge and detox in case they want to join in? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, sugaraddiction.com, uh, you just go there and there's a big picture of a yellow book. And that used to be on Amazon. It was a bestseller in healthy living at one time. And we give it away now. And you can just download that book. And uh, we also have a 30 day challenge. You'll see that up there too. There's probably a big button there somewhere. And just uh, take a look at the thing. It tells about my mother's story and stuff. And basically it's a video every single day um, it, you know, from me kind of outlining the process so that you're not like guessing what's going on in your brain, your body, you know, why you're hungry, why you're depressed. And it tracks with the whole 30 days. And it also pops you into Zoom meetings. We have every week, night of the week and soon every night of the week. And we have uh, a forum with 7,000 people, some as many as three and four years off of sugar who help out back in there. And, and so there's a lot of support and a lot of people doing exactly what you might be listening to this for, which is getting off sugar and to get through the first 30 days and make it a lifestyle because you don't want to like, get on that roller coaster. Everybody's been on that roller coaster. They've lost 10 pounds you know, and then they gain it back and then they lose, you know, they don't, you got to get off that roller coaster. And just the things that we've been discussing are the, how to do it. And, you know, on the detox, we show you how, to, you know, exactly how to do it. 
So make sure you guys, it's so nice of Michael to give you his free book. Make sure you take advantage of it. And if you get a chance to sign up for his challenge, I think it would be well worth it. What are three simple tips for anybody out there? Just quick tips for them to kick the sugar itch. Nice. Well, the first one is not, uh, it's not what you eat, it's what you eliminate. And that's got a double meaning, if you know what I mean. Uh, it, it's not, it's not, it's not about the food. It's really not about the food. And the last thing I'd like to leave people with is that what we found through our, you know, most of our folks have done six in, in the survey, 6.8 different diets, right? And most of them a lot more than that. Um, and most of the folks are pioneers in some way, right? In other words, you go back to their school, you go back to their original job, you go back to their athletics, their, their scholastic, whatever it is, um, they are kind of pioneers. They're not afraid to do a little research, listen to a podcast, take, you know, read some more and actually take action, you know, to do something different. And so if that resonates with you, you're a little bit of a rebel, a little bit of a pioneer, you're still, we're still early adopters in this. This is by no means a societally accepted thing where, look, you quit drinking. All right. You quit smoking. Good job. You quit smoking or you quit using sugar. They're like, what are you crazy? How are you? Bah, bah, bah. You know, they, you start to get in an argument with people. And so if people feel like they might be a little bit of a pioneer, uh, they might be a little bit of a rebel uh, and they're health conscious, which I'm sure everyone listening to your podcast is, they might want to try the, you know, try my scratch test. Try, I call it buying into Mikey's fantasy. Just try to, to uh, uh, give yourself 30, 60 or 90 days sugar free and see what happens. Well, thank you. And I really enjoyed how well informed you are and <laughs> you. how you present your topic. Uh, it, it made it very interesting. And also as well, I salute you for overcoming your addiction and helping thousands of others. That's, that's quite a tribute. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I same to you. I mean, the, the people that are out there, you know, getting the good information out there deserve a, a round of applause for sure. Yeah. And thank you so much. And thank you everybody for listening to this episode of the Sisterhood of Sweat. Thanks everybody. Great name. <laughs>